Go. Good. Belly. Very good. Yeah, yeah. I catch it whenever I can. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You're going to do a feature on this? Uh, I'm, I'm just about, well, we're going to do a whole hour's worth of show right here, right now. Oh, okay. So I'm well, just about to go live. Right. Okay, okay, excuse me. Cheers. Good morning, and we want to thank all of our partners who are embedding the show today. Starting off with Autoblog, great having the Autoblog people carrying the show. Also, the virtualdriver.com, dcautogeek.com, rawautos.com, drivenmavens.com, and rumblestrip.net. Thank you all for carrying the show, and we'll get to that more in a minute. Also want to thank in our chat room, Dave Foley, AKA Miradart, Josh Lewis, and DC Auto Geek. We'll be going in just a minute as we now thank our sponsors for this webcast. Auto Line Live from the North American International Auto Show is brought to you by our signature sponsors, Chrysler, Dodge, Fiat, Jeep, and Ram. And also by Audi, Truth in Engineering. Bosch, the number of clean diesel models in North America will double by 2014. Bosch Clean Diesel, good, clean, fun. And by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. And now, live from the North American International Auto Show in Detroit, here's John McElroy. Welcome to the 2012 Detroit Auto Show. We're webcasting live from the floor of Cobo Center. We have a terrific lineup of guests that I'll be interviewing today. And in fact, we've got our first guest right here, right now, Mary Barra, the head of all product development at General Motors. Mary, so good to have you here well, with thanks, us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Big show for General Motors this one. It is, it's exciting. I mean, you've got a couple of uh, new production cars, most notably the Cadillac ATS. Why don't we yes. start and talk about that? Because there's so many cars to talk about, but you've got to be very proud of this because we learned a little bit more about the, the baby Cadillac. Yes. 3,400 pound curb weight. This from a company that's not known for lightweight cars. That's pretty lightweight for a car in that segment. Absolutely, and I'm, you know, I'm really proud of the designers and the engineering team that work together to develop the ATS. I mean, I think it shows the capability when there's that focus, and as, as we know from uh, uh, Dave Leon and his team, it was a focus on every single gram and making the trade-offs, not just uh, completely optimizing weight, but making sure we made our weight uh, decisions and component decisions to optimize the performance of the vehicle. And I'm confident it is going to be a great vehicle. So I've got to take it that this is a, a sign of things to come from General Motors. You can design lightweight cars. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think the ATS is our first example, but there's many more to come with that focus that the team definitely knows how to execute. Look. We can come back to the ATS in a minute, but sure. two concept cars that Chevrolet yeah. showed this morning yes. caught me by surprise. I didn't know that they were coming. Mm -hmm. The Code and the True. Yes. Do I have that right? Those yes, are the you right do. names? Yes. Let's start with the Code because to me that sort of looks, don't be insulted by this, but it's almost BMW 1 series, like, or even the original 2002 BMW. And I know it's not a copy mm -hmm. of that, but there's a feel to that car that reminds me of one of the most terrific cars that ever hit the roads. Well, you know, I think, again, uh, a very talented design team that came up with that, really looking at the research and the data and the feedback that we got from millennials across the country. And so I think they looked at that, understood what they look for in styling, and I think it's a, it's a beautiful vehicle. I think, you know, very different um, than the, uh, the, uh, the True. And so when you put the two of them together, I mean, I think it starts to talk about 80 million millennials and that they are going to look for many different variants. But uh, again, both, be both beautiful vehicles, both different. And talk a little bit more about the code in terms of what it is. I mean, uh, I know it's rear drive, but I don't know a whole lot more about conceptually what that kind of car might be like. Well, again, I think we're looking for a vehicle that has is fun to drive, that has great fuel economy, that has the the performance uh, that. Uh, you know, people are looking for that it's nimble and quick, but yet is an affordable package. And I think when you pull all that together, I mean, it, again, it's a concept. There's yet a lot that we're going to pull. I think we're going to learn a lot from the auto show and other auto shows when we take those vehicles and get input from um, people of what they're looking for. But to, to come together, that's uh, that's the, the the beginning. And the true, 
and yes. I, I'm told that might be front wheel drive, but again, what are you trying to achieve with that? Well, again, I think it's, I, I, when I look at the True, I, I you know, think it's gorgeous. I really like the, the matte white. I think that uh, really showed it off nicely, but I think it's that sports car in all of us that we all want that sleek performance vehicle, and I think it really uh, you know, delivered that well. Now, you mentioned that both those cars are aimed at millennials, 20-somethings or thereabouts, right? Isn't that a real challenge for the automotive industry because today's 20-somethings are very different when I was a 20-something in that if I wanted to go someplace, hang out with my friends and whatnot, I had to get in the car and drive there. Today, with your smartphones, your iPads, you can Skype or text or talk or do whatever you want. They don't seem to be as interested in automobiles. Well, and I think the answer, that, in my opinion, and looking at a lot of the research and working with John McFarlane and his team, is, is maybe not yet, because you're absolutely right. Our, our desire to get out and get our vehicles was our freedom and our ability to, to, to be with our friends. They have that live with their smartphone, with texting, with Facebook, but there still is going to be a big need for the freedom that an automobile, a, a, whether it's a car, truck, or crossover provides. And that's why the research we're doing and the way we're doing it is so critical, to really understand what is going to resonate with that uh, you know, millennial population and you know, the various segments for, for uh, transportation going forward. So you run all product development for General Motors, which is really impressive. What are the biggest challenges that you see going forward right now? Is it the fuel economy regulations or what? Well, definitely making sure that we have the right fuel economy and that we lead in each of the segments and are offering that value to customers is critically important. And, and having working on the right advanced technology, because it's really going to be a multitude of solutions that I think are going to meet the needs around the globe. Uh, so that definitely is a challenge. I, I would say that we have such a talented uh, group of uh, engineers and designers. I'm confident that given the right assignments and direction, they're going to find the right solutions. And we're also working with our suppliers in a new and different way to make sure we're partnering because there's so much to learn. We need to, do, we need to leverage all that learning and work together. The fuel economy regulations, though, after 2015 get really tight, right. makes somebody like me wonder, how do you do full-size pickup trucks and SUVs and even full-size sedans that give people the room that they want, yet gives them the uh, fuel economy that the law requires and does it in a way that doesn't kill everybody's pocketbook? Well, I think the Malibu um, with the assist is a great example. I mean, here you have a vehicle, it's a full-size sedan, so it provides all of that functionality. It's beautifully designed, and it gets a 25% improvement from what people expect from fuel economy for a, a, you know, an option price of about $1,800, $1,900. So, I mean, I think that's a very good example. As you walk around the show floor, I don't know if you've had a chance to do that, what do you want to keep your eye out on what the competition's doing? Well, I haven't had a chance, but I'm, I'm uh, very anxious to do that. And I mean, I, I guess I want to take it all in. I mean, there's so many important components of, of, of design, technology, fuel economy, and I, again, there's a lot of very uh, capable uh, OEMs here, so I want to take it all in. <laughs> that sounds a little too politically correct. I'm sure you want to rip into what the competition's doing and find out what's at the heart of it. <laughs> Well, you know, I do want, I want to understand, like I said, I mean, there's, some, there's no easy pass anymore in this global auto industry. I mean, there's incredibly capable um, uh, companies. So it's really looking and seeing where are they headed and understanding where we stack up and making sure, you know, our, our intent is to lead. Hey, we're not in it to place, we're in it to win. I keep hearing throughout the industry that there's a shortage of really good technical people. And yet I also hear General Motors say, maybe it's got too many of them. How do you, how do you balance that, a need for technical uh, people and yet maybe the fact that the corporation has more people in that area of the business than it needs. Well, uh, I, I think you've got to look at it. Um, first of all, you know, having the right technical people is critical. The right designers and engineers is absolutely critical to winning in this in this uh, very competitive industry. Uh, what I've been focused on is, in some cases, we had people working on things that support engineering as opposed to actually engineering cars, trucks, and crossover, and we've had a shift of moving in that direction. I do believe in the next five to ten years there's going to be a, 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 a fight for the great technical talent, and we're positioning, we want to make sure we're the place to work. Well, we'll definitely have to keep an eye on that and see mm -hmm. if you make it the place to work. Yeah. But it's been very impressive to see the products coming out of General, General Motors. Mary Barra, thanks so much for Thank taking you. the time to be on the show today. Really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, John. Good to see you. To all the different things that you're working on. Absolutely, absolutely. I hope your next call goes well. Yeah, thank you much. Yeah, Thanks, Mary. I'm put this right where they had it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there you okay, go. I'll take that. Thank you, Mike.
no one just hands you the title, most advanced technology in its class. It needs to be earned. Earned with smart beam headlamps. Earned with vented temperature control seats. Earned with an 8.4 inch touchscreen. And if you're driving one, you know what it means to earn something. Fix it or find a new job, all right? I got it, I'm sorry. These people, huh? You know, I've found that anger is the enemy of instruction. <laughs> you don't know the egos that I have to deal with. You're probably right. Thank you. Wherever you are. I'm pretty sure that was Bill Jackson. It's quite famous. A million championships, triangle offense innovator. The Audi A8, named best large luxury sedan. Nice wheels, Zen Master. Thank you, Todd. Invisible. Deceptive. Unpredictable. Black ice. It's a slippery slope. Unless you drive a Jeep Grand Cherokee that lets you select the terrain, transfer power to the appropriate wheel, and regain traction on snow and ice-covered roads. Then, it's just your normal, everyday slope. Welcome back to AutoLine Live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show. And joining me right now is Jim Farley, the Group Vice President of Global Marketing, Sales, and Service for the Ford Motor Company. And great having you back, as always. You're nice just to so much here. fun to talk to. <laughs> and you've got to be so geeked. I mean, you guys got so much going at this show. The new Ford Fusion that's being unveiled, the Lincoln yeah. MKZ, big yes. step forward for, for Lincoln. You must have put a massive effort into this show. We did for a, a couple reasons. And the other big news for us is the going public basically with the very mass uh, availability of EcoBoost. Both the, the new Escape that we launched in, uh, in LA and uh, the new Fusion is really one of our biggest bets in the company. So we always talk about products, but the other big news for us is that this is a second mass 20,000 plus a month product that's going to bet on EcoBoost and fuel economy. Uh, I think for us, you know, the Lincoln stand physically is a big, um, is big news for us, not only in the product, because it gives a glimpse of where we think the brand's going to go, not just the product. This is really Ford's coming out party, as it were, for Lincoln, yes, yes. of really putting a lot of emphasis on this brand. That's right. A couple of years ago, we, we made the commitment that we would focus on Lincoln like we focused on Ford. You've seen what's happened with, you Ford. Know, with yeah. Ford. So, um, we've now made the commitment of unique upper bodies. Uh, we have seven new products. Uh, we're going to see a concept that kind of hints very, um, very strongly at where we're going as a brand. But that won't be enough. Uh, I've been involved in one uh, launch of a luxury brand, you know, more than 20 years ago. And although it's a long journey, our aspirations are really different than the current offer in the marketplace. And the stand and the product come together kind of to go back to the 60s Lincoln of an independent minded kind of bespoke product with a very personalized service almost very different than the sales you know 300,000 unit uh, sales you know war type of brands we're competing with how are you going to market the Lincoln brand then are you going to create something that really signals that this is a totally different feel to the brand absolutely can you uh, give us any hint of what that'll be like not necessarily but 2012 uh, the stand is probably the best example of the new Lincoln um, and it's not necessarily new I always believe whether it's Ford or Lincoln that the truth is there somewhere uh, and uh, authentically when Lincoln was at its best, the 30s, the 60s, the 70s, it was known as a brand for independent-minded people. You didn't buy it to get noticed necessarily, but you bought it to say you're different. And uh, we are really engaged in that kind, of, um, that kind of proposal on the product side. On the experience side, because the brand or the other competitors, especially German brands, have gotten so large in scale, their dealerships, their lineup is so complex, dealerships are so enormous, we're really 
kind of discovering the boutique phase of the industry. We really want to see the brand as a more of a boutique experience. The doorman knows your name, it's very personal, it's not big, it feels small. I think that's something new in our industry and, uh, and we're going to be explaining to everyone our brand vision, the dealership and the product tomorrow. Let's talk about advertising and marketing, your forte yeah. especially. I love what Ford's doing in all of its ads, especially the truck ads, combination of text, yes. pictographs, yes. and talk a little bit about that because okay. boy, it just resonates so well with me. I'll never forget, I had a media rep, and I can't remember who it was, but they said, you know, Jim, no, never forget when you're creating that ad that um, in late night TV, 20% of the people are drunk or asleep. <laughs> now, I, I don't know if that's really true, but the point is, if your ads don't work, with the volume down completely, they're not going to work. Plus, think about the digital side. We live in a visual world, especially in digital space. If you want to use that content again in any way, but the most important thing is truck advertising kind of got into a ridiculous demonstration phase where everyone was pulling freight trains and planes and and I think we wanted to get back to really a customer-centric approach. But if we just had someone blabbing on about how great our fuel economy is, it wouldn't be enough. We needed that graphic rein uh, reinforcement of the very thing you're hearing in your ear uh, so that you hear it twice. And uh, as a leader in the industry, uh, I think that, that was important for us to have a cut-through creative where you heard the message twice i.e. with your ears and with your eyes, yep. is what you're saying. Absolutely. And what I like too is how you'll take pictographs and drop it next to the text. So Absolutely. it'll be the word, you, you might say fuel economy and show a fuel pump or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely, or I think the neatest thing is we've really handed over the marketing of the brand to people. You notice in our ads, we have people now being interviewed and talking about whether you like it or not. Uh, we, don't re we really believe that customers are the best people to sell our brand. And so on the truck ads, we wanted to really, even though we're the leader, we want to present our engineers as kind of almost truck geeks. So we use pictures like pizza and, you know, um, so that our engineers are seen as like the greatest engineers in the world, but we're almost too geeky to, to relate because we want to build the best widget. I think the graphics allowed us to have fun with the advertising without being funny and a comedian. Yeah. And I noticed that it's not just in your ads. When you had the, the unveil of the Ford Fusion here yes. at the Detroit show, same deal. you opened with the same same approach, not the yes. same, but yep. the same thinking of using text graphics and really emphasizing the message that way. It's a great pickup because uh, we find in, in all the complexity of all of our lives when we consume media, you got to keep it simple. Keep the message simple. Ours is very much focused around fuel economy. And when you say something, make sure that the customer is seeing something that reinforces what you say. And only then can you have a really chance to cut through. Now that's all on the, the Ford brand side, right? Lincoln, how are you going to do it? Well, we're in a transition phase now. We're just launching a uh, pretty substantial freshening for the S and the T. That'll be big news. But really, um, the big news for us in Lincoln is the preparation for the brand's um, acceleration. Uh, with the new launch of our lineup coming later this year. So we're really getting ready. We just um, created a new advertising agency uh, and partners with WPP in New York. That's where the luxury talent is. We have a whole dedicated team. We just, uh, told, um, we just launched a, a new design studio. Uh, we actually have had it for a couple of years, but we're just talking about it now, 180 designers working dedicated on just Lincoln, Lincoln now, just to Lincoln. Wow. And uh, we have more and more resources going on in Lincoln now for the last couple of years. But we've been pretty quiet about it because we've been so focused on the Ford brand. Now the product's about to come out, 12 will be the year where if we do our job right, people start at least talking about Lincoln. And you oversee marketing and advertising and sales for Ford globally. Yeah, absolutely. Does, does everything that we've been talking about, you know, the, the text, the pictographs, is that being used in advertising outside of the U.S. Not market? Not necessarily. Really, the flavor of our advertising around the world is the idea that our customers can sell our brand. So we just launched a new territory in Australia. We had actually, our TV commercial uh, is one of our diesel engineers because it gets a thousand kilometers on one tank we have her visiting all her Facebook friends friends, in one tank of di a diesel across a whole country 
And um, we put our own engineers in the TV commercials, not a spokesperson, it's our frontline engineers. We're doing the same thing in Europe now. Uh, Europe is uh, using their own uh, engineers. Our bet is that in the age where everyone's skeptical of big companies, it's so important to be believable. And the only way to be believable is not to have an Alan or Bill or myself or even our spokesperson, Mike Rowe, in the U.S. It's got to be a real believable person. So our bet and the flavor of our work is the end customer selling our brand. And speaking of end customers selling the brand, you're big on social media and, and engagement. Absolutely. Anything new that you can talk to us about in, in that part of your business? Well, we have a really uh, big launch of the Explorer Roots, which is going to be a, a pretty big deal. We did the Fiesta movement a couple years ago, still paying dividends for us. Uh, but now we're going to take that and scale it in a much bigger way for the pre-launch for the Escape. The Escape doesn't go on uh, sale for a couple months, but we have Escape Roots where uh, we have seven teams and uh, we already have the teams. You go online and you help those teams as they go to a new city with their new Escape to uh, win, frankly, to win money and prizes. And uh, the, you know, so far I think that's the kind of taste of our marketing. Pre-launch, we take a lot of money that we usually used to dedicate for launch period when the product is available. We're now putting it six months, a year before the product even comes out, social and digital, do a contest or something where people are talking about it, and then that really helps. We found with the Explore, Explore Live, and all of our launches, we literally had three, four months of orders before we even sold one. Oh. Well, that's so amazing about this business is, yeah, it's all about product but you have to get the message out that the product's there and make it break out of the clutter so people pay attention. How I look at it, John, is I don't care who you are in our industry. Your brand is either in front or behind your product. And if it's in front, you better figure out how to get your product uh, to catch up. And if your brand is behind your product, like it was in Ford's case, my job is to make sure that that time it takes to catch up is as quick as possible. And so, really, our job at Ford in most of the mature market is myth busting, to take the brand where people thought it was here and, the, and use the facts about our product that we have the most fuel efficient, you know, C car, B car, now CD car, small crossover, and use the marketing to get people to miss bust, myth bust so they start to really catch up to where the products really are. Well, good. So much fun to be here at the Auto Show and watch those Isn't myths it? be busted. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a real, it's a really exciting year, and I have to say, I'm really excited about the Lincoln Stand. It's really the first time, I think, since the 60s Continentals and the 70 Mark series that, you know, uh, we have something different. Well, good. Jim Farley, thanks so much for stopping by. Very interesting story of what's going on at Ford. Very good. We'll be right back with another interview. Yeah. Out of there. Drunk or asleep? Do you like that? Yeah, I do like that. I do like that. I forget the guy who told me. Yeah. I, I never forgot that. I, That's a great line. You know, every time I see a piece of creative around the world, I'm like, if I was drunk or asleep, would I yeah, yeah. remember this? Yeah, that's right. That's right. No, I think good that's cool. Today. Yeah. Thanks, Take man. Yeah, well, I'll be back over there. Okay. Take care. Good day, you Fred. guys. Red Diaz. Yeah, come on in. Yeah. Let's talk Ram. As soon as they give me the signal. Is this in the shot behind the studio? It's fine. You can leave that there. Would you rather that? No, 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 no. Leave it there. That's fine. I've, I've got stuff here. I don't plan to use it either. I'll get you mic'd up, sir. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, no, I want you to quote market share gains out three decimal points <laughs> from the third quarter. Right. You may want to just one of the buttons to keep that wire behind. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay, Fred. You know, yeah. You look good. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Really good. You having really fun good. Out here? Yeah, no, we're uh, we ended up the four. Okay, whoop, we're about to get going here. Okay. Which, uh, where do you want us to look? Just, just, just you and I talk. Okay. We got three cameras. They'll yeah. definitely get you. Okay. Welcome back live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show, and with me right now is Fred Diaz, the president and CEO of the Ram Truck brand. Fred. Great having you here live with us. It's good to be here, John. Really good. Thank you for having me. Oh, uh, well, look, let's talk Ram because you guys had let's a pretty good trucks. year in 2011 and 2012 has got to look even better to you. We did. We had a great year. We're very proud of how well the, the brand has done. 
uh, the personality that we've created, as you know, Sam Elliott as our voice of RAM, and we're delivering on products that the consumers want. Our, our market share has increased, our sales have increased for the entire brand over 21%. Mm -hmm. And so we're very, very proud of, of how well we've done in the market this year. Well, go through your line, because you have a fairly limited lineup, at least right now, don't you? I mean, you've got uh, the full-size Ram pickup, and you've got the Dakota, and... And heavy duty, and the Dakota will, will, uh, will not be a part of our future product plan. Uh, but getting into light duty, our light duty increased uh, in sales year over year, over 21%. That's a big uh, increase. It's a big increase. Our heavy duty also did quite well, also increasing over 22%. And then our chassis cab, another big story, almost 40%, 38% market share gain on chassis cab. And all of that together gave us over a 21% sales, sales gain over the year. Now, the overall U.S. market did not go up that much. How do you get that much more sales and market share gain when the market itself didn't grow as much? I think it's our rifle focus attention on delivering to the truck customer what they want and what they need. And we take a lot of pride in knowing what the truck customer truly, genuinely wants. And we're giving them products such as our Tradesman Edition, our Express Edition, our new heavy duty capability. Uh, the Laramie Longhorn truck has done really well. And we're really delivering with a rifle focus what the consumers, what the truck customers want for their vocation of choice or their recreation of choice. Of course, Chrysler split the Dodge and the Ram brands. Yep. You know, it just used to be Dodge truck. Sure. What's that done for you, splitting that Ram brand off as its own separate entity? It's, it's been fantastic. It's given both brands the opportunity to occupy and play in their own spaces and create their own personalities. You saw earlier this morning with the Dodge Dart and what Reed did there and what we're doing with the truck brand and, and using, again, getting back to Sam Elliott as the voice of Ram, that is the true essence and, and it resonates with truck buyers on how you want to market to a truck customer. They want to be full of pride and, and proud of the truck that they drive. But it there's still the same dealerships that are selling it. That's so correct. does that cause any confusion for customers to come in and go, wait, wait am I in a Ram dealership or a Dodge dealership? No, nope. every, every Dodge uh, vehicle or every Dodge dealer that sold Dodge vehicles now automatically sells Ram trucks. And now each one of our dealerships is branded Dodge and Ram, and they have separate areas in the showroom so that when a customer comes in, they know they're in Jeep country, they're in Dodge country, they're in Ram country, they're in Chrysler world. And it works really well that way. And, and um, at first, you know, two years ago, people were scratching their heads saying, what are you doing? What is this? But now, fast forward two years later, and, and it's uh, after our dealer announcement show about a year and a half ago, that's when it all clicked and the dealer said, we get it. We understand what you're doing now with all the brands. What do you do next from your lineup standpoint? I mean, we see you used to have the, the Sprinter van, which went away when Daimler and Chrysler split. Right. Uh, but we see Ford talking about bringing in the Transit, and it's already got the little Transit Connect. We see Nissan getting into the commercial van market. I got to believe that's something that you'd like to get into. We, we want to have the full breadth of, of lineup for the commercial vehicle and the fleet buyer out there. We've already announced that we are bringing the Doblo in as part of our commercial Doblo lineup. Doblo being one of the, the Fiat exactly, little vans that they've exactly, got. Exactly, exactly. And we're still working on our November 9th plan that, that we presented a couple of years ago to bring the other areas of vans and, and working with Fiat to bring those into the marketplace and those will be announced sometime in the, in the near future. I, I think the Ducato is another one of the big ones. Ducato is, is one that we're looking at. We're also looking at the possibility of a daily as we mentioned on the November 4th day and um, November 9th day and, and it's, uh, it's great to be able to work with our partners at Fiat and we're like kids in a candy shop when you can see all that technology and everything that they have and, and most importantly is the spirit of, of trust and working together as, as, as a team and the brotherhood and sisterhood between the two companies. It's, it's like, it's a culture like I've never seen before and, and it's fun to mm -hmm. work with this company. Of course, we've been talking about the American market. I gotta believe that you're looking overseas as well. And of course, you're running Mexico now as well, That's right? Correct. So That's correct. I'm Chrysler of Mexico. Mexico, right? Chrysler of Mexico, right? right? Yeah. For all brands in Mexico. And uh, for the Ram brand, we're at the moment, we're looking at North Central Focus, at North America Focus in Canada, US, and Mexico, where we do quite well. And the future will determine where we decide to expand beyond that. Mm, but are you looking to expand outside of the NAFTA region? Everything is, is on the table and, and under evaluation as far as where we can go. We won't do it until we know that we have the right pieces of parts to put a product together 
that will definitely deliver and resonate in the marketplace and other, and other areas outside North America. Fred, as we go beyond 2015, as you well know, fuel economy standards get really tough. Yeah. And I think that's going to have the biggest impact on vehicles like you sell, sure. a full RAM sure. pickup. It's hard to make that thing get really good fuel economy unless you throw a fortune's worth of technology into it. And a lot of the contractors and the like who buy that truck aren't going to want to spend that kind of money. How, how do you make this thing get the kind of fuel economy it needs to get? Uh, you said it for me, a fortune's worth of technology. And that's the beauty of our partnership and working with, with Fiat. They've got some amazing technologies that, that we are the beneficiaries of and that we share with one another. And as you know, heavy duty is all about the capability of the truck. And with the light duty buyer, it's all about MPG with, with capability as well. And so our focus and our strategic vision going forward is capability on heavy duty, MPG on light duty. So what, what, what else? What am I missing about what's really exciting at Ram? It's, I think the whole, the whole corporation and the whole brand is just really excited about the personality and the presence that, that we've gathered uh, and we've maintained. And also, I think the world is starting to realize that we have one heck of a beautiful and great truck. And the residual value increases of over 17% this year is an exact, you know, that's not me just being in love with the brand or with the corporate one of the corporation's brand. Those are facts. The sales share, the sales gains, the share gains, what we've done with residual values. We now have some of the best residual values in the entire domestic market among trucks. And I think that shows the world and, and, the, and the consumers that they like what they're seeing and they like what we're doing. That's a good note to end up on. Fred Diaz, the president and CEO of the Ram brand. Thank you so much for stopping Thank by. You very Real much, pleasure. John. Thank you for having me. Good deal. Take care. Thanks, man. Yeah, they'll, they'll get the mic from you. You won't find the toughness of a Ram 1500 combined with the legendary power of a Hemi V8 in any other truck. It's a beautiful thing. Guts, glory, Ram. The clean diesels are coming. The number of clean diesel light vehicle models offered to North Americans will double by 2014. When given the choice, one in three customers choose clean diesel over gasoline engines. Why? Because of lower total cost of ownership, recouping premium costs in less than 18 months, longer range and better fuel mileage, lower CO2 emissions. Clean diesel, good, economical, functional. Bosch, invented for life. They say that with great power comes great responsibility. Well, when you own a Durango, you'll have tons of power, enough to tow up to 7,400 pounds. So owning a Durango means you now have the responsibility to go dirt biking, ATVing, motorcycling, boating, jet skiing, and show a Ford Explorer a thing or two about what it means to have best-in-class towing. The SUV is back. Welcome back live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show for 2012. It's great to be having this live webcast going on and joining us right now is Reed Biglin, the president and CEO of the Dodge brand. And Reed, what a big day for you guys, unveiling the Dodge Dart at the Detroit Auto Show. Well, no question, a very exciting day for us. You know, we've been out of that compact car segment for all intents and purposes for a few years now, so it's great to return with the Dart. You know, what has really amazed me is just hearing people 
outside of the business talk about, oh my gosh, Dodger's bringing back the dart. And they all reminisce about when they had a dart. And I'm going, really? Yeah. You just come out with a new car, call it the dart, and everyone starts talking about it. How easy is that for you? Well, it has created a lot of chatter. And you know, we did a lot of research on the name dart. You must have agonized over what to name the car. Well, you know, it really came into, into place relatively easy. A much younger demographic just looked upon it when they saw the class exclusive uh, aerodynamics. Uh, that the dart and the very nature of the dart just fits and you know some of the older demographic it's not your grandfather's dart but it, it's still right. living large in drag strips around the country. But you must have worried about bringing back an old name and go yeah 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 will people just see it as old and dated or? Well it's always a concern although the original dart had a good run we sold almost four million darts and one of the reasons why in our initial teaser photos at the beginning of the de December we wanted to get the name out there let that thing uh, have a little bit of a life of its own and then today the focus can be on the car. I'm told that it can cost an automaker an easy hundred million dollars to try and establish a new name in the marketplace. No, no question, it takes a lot of uh, money and a lot of resources to create brand awareness and I think we've jumped the queue a little bit here by bringing back the dark. I, I think you have too and you know this is just my non-scientific sort of listening around to the buzz and uh, I think it's going to pay off for you. How are you going to really tell the public though that this car is out and what its attributes are. How do you plan to market and advertise this? Well, it really started at the beginning of December by trying to pique some of the customer's interest with the name that we just talked about, as well as some of our exterior photos. A week after that, the interior photos, and then of course the big reveal here in, uh, in Detroit. So right away, a lot of people are aware of the Dart. And we'll start to spool things up here in the second quarter on more traditional venues, TV, radio, newspaper, and of course the internet. And I've got to imagine that it's both styling and fuel economy that you're really going to hammer in your message, or is there more to it than that? Well, you know, no question. I think the key why buys in the segment are price, fuel economy, and reliability, but they're no longer differentiators in the segment. We think we're there on all three of those, but the unique thing about the 2013 Dart is it brings a whole lot more. Best in class technology and outstanding exterior styling. Okay, let's talk about the, some of the rest of the lineup too, because it's not all about Dart. You had a pretty good uh, run there too. I saw towards the end of the year, the Dodge Avenger was selling strong. Avenger sales in December were up 58% year over year. 58%, so that's got a nice ring to it. No question, <laughs> it finished the year on a high note. Uh, the Durango, Consumer Reports, number one recommended uh, full-size SUV. We had our best uh, Durango month in, in December and just a tremendous amount of momentum, not only throughout the Dodge brand, but also throughout the various Chrysler Group products. We had our highest retail sales in four years in December, so it was a great way to finish off a very strong 2011. And we should let the audience know that you run Chrysler of Canada. It's not enough to have one job in Chrysler. You've got to have, what well, you got three. You've got Dodge, you got Chrysler, and you've got sales, yes, right? Yes, I do. I don't think Mr. Marchione would have it any other way. So <laughs> it has a tendency to keep people busy. But uh, we had a great deal of success last year in the U.S. We gained more market share than anybody else. And the same story in Canada. We gained more market share last year in Canada than any other manufacturer. But a, a little bit different mix of what was selling in Canada? A little bit of a different mix in Canada. The Ram pickup truck is the second highest selling vehicle in Canada. The Dodge Grand Caravan is the fourth highest selling vehicle in Canada. You're not just talking Chrysler lineup, I'm you're talking, talking in the whole all, country. All over, out of the 250 different nameplates to choose from, we're the only manufacturer to have two of the top five highest selling vehicles up there. So we're very proud of that. And let's talk a little bit about sales too, because what impressed me about Chrysler, and I started noticing it in 2010, is that with really not much new in the showroom at all, you were starting to gain sales and market share. Last year you poured on even more. This is the year and even next year when you really start getting the product. So how have you been really boosting sales? Well, give us some tricks of the trade. Well, I, I think it all started this time last year with our 16 either all new or significantly refreshed products. We had four completely all new and then we made some significant interventions into another 12 products. And that's the ticket to this industry. We finished the year with 21 consecutive months of year-over-year -year sales growth. And as I said, uh, highest selling uh, vehicle manufacturer from a market share perspective in the U.S. Retail sales up 43% and uh, considerable success as well in Canada for the second year but, in a row. But what is it? Is it making sure that the, the dealers are getting the kinds of cars spec the way customers want it? Or? You know, I think it's all the basic blocking and tackling, but there's still no substitute for product. And those interventions that we made to our products pretty much had three things in common. 
one more horsepower and greater fuel economy. Look, gone are the days if you wanted more horsepower, you had to sac sacrifice fuel economy and vice versa. Dramatic improvements in our exterior styling and probably the biggest Achilles heel we had a few years ago was our interiors and we made dramatic improvements as well in our interiors and you see that with respect to our new cars. So are you happy with Dodge's lineup right now or what would you like to add? You know, there's always room for improvement, but pretty content right now. If you look at the lineup that we have, the all new Dodge Charger, won an Automobile Magazine All-Star Award, the Durango I touched on doing very well in the Consumer Report rankings, and now we add the Dodge Dart, which is gonna fill arguably the greatest hole in Chrysler Group's product platform, and that'll be hitting dealership showrooms in Q2. And uh, we see some of the, your competition coming out with even smaller cars, B-Class cars, as they call them. I, Fiat's got some pretty terrific B-Class cars. I'm sure one of them would look good as a Dodge. They do, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, I think the Fiat brand in particular, we still have unfinished business there. We, we finished the year with Canada, U.S. Fiat sales around 26,000. That's pretty much pure incremental for us. And December was our strongest retail Fiat month of the year. So we finished Fiat on a high note and I think we still have uh, some considerable growth opportunity ahead of us with that product. You just had an interesting sales number, 26,000. About 16 was in the U.S., is that we right? We had about 21,000 in the U.S. Okay. and about 5,000 in Canada. Okay, so it's selling disproportionately better in Canada then, right? Uh, about a four to one. Now that market, uh, if you remember, about 42 percent of the Canadian market is small and compact vehicles. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when you just look at compact cars, about 25 percent of the market is Canada. About 15% in the US. So Americans still like generally their larger cars and larger SUVs, certainly relative to Canada and also relative to the rest of the world. I think the real anomaly with respect to the size of the cars is here in the US, whereas Canada is much more similar to Mexico, South America, or Europe. Mm -hmm. Very interesting that uh, you see those regional differences, even though the border is, I, in fact, I can get across the border faster than I can get home. Yeah, depending <laughs> upon your golf game, you could probably fire a golf ball from Kobo here into Canada. No, no, but it uh, would slice way before yeah, it hit you'd there. You'd hit the water. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> right, exactly right. Well, Reed Biglin, thanks so much for stopping by and bringing us up to speed with what's going on at Dodge. It's Thank gotta be an exciting year looming for you here. It's an exciting year in 11, and I'm sure 12 will be equally the same. Thank you very much for having me. Happy New My Year. My pleasure, thank you. That work okay for you, John? Yeah, or? yeah. This was this was terrific. This I is terrific. All your questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one just hands you the title most advanced technology in its class. It needs to be earned. Earned with smart beam headlamps. Earned with vented temperature control seats. Earned with an 8.4 inch touchscreen. And if you're driving one, you know what it means to earn something. Non puoi farne a meno, sei perso pensando che sarò tua per sempre. The Fiat 500 Abarth. You'll never forget the first time you see one. don't know what it is. Yeah. It's really more about communicating. It's okay. We have industry people watching this show. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Where do you want me looking at you? Just at me, because we got three cameras. Welcome back live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show, and I'm talking right now with my friend Charlie Vogelheim from Response Logics. So, Charlie, you've been walking around the show. What stands out? Well, what stands out overall, again, is, is the upbeat nature of the show. And you may have heard that a lot, but certainly we're on uh, the upswing here. You know, uh, you don't the have industry to... finished a good year in 2011, and well, things yeah, look and better. Well, yeah, not only did we finish a good year, but we finished a good year strong. I mean, better than most people thought. And, you know, I, I was at the Society of Auto Analysts last night, and we were talking about it. And, and just to point out, now we talked about it too much, but 
the worst decline in the history of the industry. So we're coming out of that, and we're coming out strong, and it affected our industry more than others. And I, the other thing we see, John, you know, when, when, when people cut back, obviously the, the quickest and, and fastest to cut back on marketing. Sometimes that means auto shows, commercials, everything that goes along with this. So as you know, I'm out in, in the western, you know, in California. I come out to Detroit and it's, this show is just so strong this year. The, the, the booths, the displays, everybody. Well, you know, my litmus test or measure is that last year on Sunday night, last night, kicking off the show, there was one media dinner. Mercedes yeah. put one on. Right. This year there were six. Yeah. And that's sort of what I see here. It's like six times what it was the last two or three yeah. years. And so I've been talking to a lot of the journalists, and you're, like yourself included, and go, boy, you know, thank goodness there wasn't a lot of cutbacks in R&D, because then all of a sudden the market would be strong and we wouldn't really have anything to show, because that's the other thing that's in line. There's some really neat stuff that they're showing here right now. Already the Ford Focus came out this morning. A lot of people talking about that. The Dodge Dart are right behind us. I mean, three takeaways there. Alfa Romeo. 40 miles per gallon and 15.9. It's like any one of those would be something that would drive you to a car and they'd be at all three. So. Yeah. And, uh, but how's the consumer in all this? I mean, well, there you know, are we some concerns. About how good the, yeah. the industry is doing, what about the consumer? Because that's going to drive everything. Right. And still a lot of concerns out there on the consumer. So, so let's first talk about, you know, there's unemployment is out there. Uh, you know, again, loss of value in your home, which was, you know, to a certain extent, a large part of your equity, and you might use that to purchase a car. And, the, you know, credit still is a little bit tight out there. So, you know, I'm involved in the internet side of the business, and, and so much talk on right now is, you know, why aren't cars sold more like on Amazon and things like that? Yes, there are things that can be improved. We're working on that, uh, our company specifically, but it, it, we can't forget it's the most complex single item bought by a consumer. And there's usually financing involved, and there's usually a trade-in involved, which adds and adds and adds. So it's not quite as simple. It'll never just be push a button and buy a car. You know, maybe we can order one or something like that later on. That seems to have been coming a little bit slow. But the consumers, I think, I think the talk, the excitement will come from all the cars that we're seeing here and the buzz around an auto show like this one is, is always a good thing. Um, you know, one of the other things, John, that, that, that came out yesterday, there, you know, as we talk about this downturn in, in the recovery is the statement that I love is there's no new normal. People keep saying, what's the new normal? Who are these new consumers? What are they looking for? And there isn't a new normal. Well, we don't know what it is. This is a cyclical business. You've mm -hmm. been around long mm -hmm. enough to see that. Right. Man. Goes up and so, down. I've said yeah. you can set your watch to the ups and downs of the auto industry. Well, you used to be able to, <laughs> but a couple of years ago, your watch broke. Yeah, that's, that's the right. That's problem what happened there. <laughs> and, you know, we kind of talk about it as we see the fits and starts as, as you're driving down the highway. You know how you get that, that stopped up section there? And then all of a sudden you get there and there's nothing there. Yeah. Well, something happened a while ago and everyone was still stopped. And I think we felt that way the last year or two. It's like, Wait, we get why you stopped a while ago, but why haven't you started up again? Mm -hmm. Here we are. Great they analogy. Up. Great analogy. What so, kind of trends have you picked up on here, or is there anything different? Well, that again, you're uh, up on? Uh, value, uh, whether that's small, uh, whether that's uh, you know, again, BMW showing the hybrids. Uh, it's all about uh, fuel economy. We haven't talked really about gas, and, and, and shoot, that's. That's a moving target, unfortunately. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we could somehow have some fuel policy that we could you know, build these vehicles or buy these vehicles according to what we knew the fuel price was going to be for the next several years. We're just not there right yeah. now. So No, I, so. I can build a good argument as to why fuel prices are going to shoot out of sight, and I can build in other cases to why. Right. They'll go nowhere. Well, I remember, you know, last night I'm, I'm listening to one of the economist predictions and I'm, I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, wait, I thought this guy was a little bit too rosy in years gone by. And you know why? Because he said fuel prices were going to go down. I'm thinking, what are you nuts? And sure enough, they, they went did. down. Right. So it's like, yeah, you, to your point, it can go either way. Um, one of the other speakers last night I just would love to comment on, you know, we had NHTSA there and they were talking about safety. And, and safety is obvious. Strickland, was yes. it? Yeah, yeah, Strickland, the head of NHTSA. And so a great, great concern on safety. And, and again, don't want to downplay anyone that, that, right. that, that's had injury or, or death in a car. And it's, it, it is a terrible thing. But I'm, I'm one of those, don't tell me what to do kind of guys a little bit. And I get a little bit, you know, with the government telling me that they're out there to say, and, and um, you know, texting, no, I'm against it. And, and the challenge there, for those of us that have younger kids or even, you know, uh, Gen Next, um, they don't know how to communicate without texting. I mean, it's part of their life. They're connected all the time to their mm -hmm. friendship. It's, it's just a mindset. So that's a real challenge that this industry has to get around. 
Now, you know, talking on the phone or, or some few of the other things, and it, hey, I'm a certified pilot, so I, I, I can do a few things in, behind the wheel. But I get a little tweaky when they say, you can't do this, you can't do that. I'm going, really? I mean, there's some people that can't drive on ice. There's some people that can't drive at night. I mean, why don't they have restrictions on them also? So it's almost like you've got that checklist of things you can do in a car. Okay, you can talk, but you can't drive at night, but you can drive on ice, but you can... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, no, I, I like that idea. Challenge. I like that idea, but it's it's... They're not going to do it. They're just oh, going to ban texting all together. Well, and, no, ban, you know, and again, I'm not, anything that, that, that requires right. two thumbs and, and your eyesight, I, I get a little lost in that myself. Yeah, so. but when they start talking about banning phone conversations, conversations and cars right. all together, I think right. they're nuts. Right. And that's my opinion. Well, yeah. They and, are crazy. Yeah, well, you know, again, we've all been in, we've been in the car, we've been engaged with a big, you know, conversation with a passenger, and it, it is a little bit distracting, but hopefully you can pay attention to what's going on while that's all happening. So. No, that's right. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that a lot of us can drive and talk, not cradle a phone, no, you know, no. in our on our shoulder or anything, no. but the, the, right. the hands-free stuff is pretty good. Right. And, and again, and so I'm not taking, I don't seem to be seeing what you watch it because it is a political year after all. But, I mean, we're all in there to drive the car. That is the purpose. The problem is for a lot of places, you know, you're using the car as a tool to get from point A to point B and you're spending time in it and you have a life going on outside of it. And, and so there is a challenge going forward, how to make this happen in a safe manner, that you can do the things you need to do, going from point A to point B, also staying communicated at an appropriate level. And, and it's, there's some interesting things going back and forth with all the automakers here. And that, that's, I'll spend a lot of time tomorrow and the next day crawling through the cars, looking at, at the interactive part of the electronic. Uh -huh. So you were at the, the automotive analyst meeting yesterday. What, what was sort of the, the buzz of what they were talking about? Again, uh, you know, optimism uh, uh, and, and again, continued growth. This industry, you know, suffered a little bit, but we're looking for, again, improvement in our industry. Uh, numbers, you know, over the 14 million point for sales next year. Um, you know, they, there's a basic agreement on what that's all going to be about. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, just the new products coming out. Oh, one other quick comment on yeah, the North yeah, American yeah, yeah. Car and Truck of the Year, because yeah. I know you're a big part of that. Yes. I walk in there and I look at the cars and I look at the trucks and, and none of those look like trucks. That's I right. mean, if you told any fourth or fifth grade class to draw a truck, that's not what they would be drawing. But it's a different vehicle, I get that. So how look, do we... We've had massive arguments about this as the jury for years, yeah. for over a decade now. What do we do with this thing? But as you know, those three vehicles are classified by the U.S. They're government classified. as trucks. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we on the North American jury really have to have a deep discussion about, and everybody knows we've got to do it. It's just that we cannot come to an agreement on what we should do. Right, right. I it's, mean, what it's, is a it truck? Is it, it's it's hard to define. Well, I know we know a lot. what a pickup is. We know what a pickup and, is. And we know That's what right. a car is. And, right. but, you know, do you do two door, do you four? So it, it's an interesting challenge. I, to, to a certain extent, you know, the, the brand Land Rover is the most truck like of those brands. It was interesting because Ludwig uh, from BMW, the new president of North America, was up there talking. And, and again, talking about the passion of BMW and the ultimate driving machine. We make cars. That's all we do. We don't make trucks. We don't, and I'm looking right there, and he's got a. Truck of the year. I go. Are you recusing yourself from the vote? Is that what you're telling me here? We don't make them less than this one, but it's not a truck in, in that sense of the word. That's right. I mean, he's talking about over the over the counter trucks. Well, Charlie Vogelheim, thanks so much for stopping by. We're always good to get your uh, viewpoints on what's happening at the auto industry. Oh man, I just love talking to you, John. It makes me a smarter guy. So <laughs> good to see you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Right. We'll be back in just a moment. Yeah. Speaking of the BMW. Guy, just hands you the title, most advanced technology in its class. It needs to be earned. Earned with smart beam headlamps. Earned with vented temperature control seats. Earned with an 8.4 inch touchscreen. And if you're driving one, you know what it means to earn something. Fix it or find a new job, all right? I got it, I'm sorry. These people, huh? You know, I found that anger is the enemy of instruction. <laughs> you don't know the egos that I have to deal with. You're probably right. Thank you. Wherever you are. I'm pretty sure that was still Jackson. 
It's quite famous. A million championships, triangle offense innovator. The Audi A8, named best large luxury sedan. Nice wheels, Zen Master. Thank you, Todd. Invisible, deceptive, unpredictable, black ice. It's a slippery slope, unless you drive a Jeep Grand Cherokee that lets you select the terrain, transfer power to the appropriate wheel, and regain traction on snow and ice-covered roads. Then, it's just your normal, everyday slope. Welcome back live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show. We've got a little bit of a break here before my next interview, but I wanted to bring some of you up to speed with the news that's come out this morning. Probably most of you already know what the selection was for, the North American Car and Truck of the Year, but in case you had not heard, the winner was the Hyundai Elantra beating out the Ford Focus and the Volkswagen Passat. On the truck side, it was the Range Rover or Land Rover Evoque beating out the Honda CRV and the BMW X3. So there you've got the latest things. And I looked at the vote tally and it was not even close. The Hyundai and the Land Rover won by huge margins. There was no uncertainty on the part of the jury, at least in the way that they voted. Uh, you've heard us talking about some of the other news that happened. Ford pulled finally officially the wraps off the Fusion. Terrific looking car, at least I think the front end is gorgeous. There's some issues in the rear three quarter that they're not bad, but I think the design gets a little bit busy. Dodge Dart, huge, huge intro here for Dodge as we were just talking about with uh, Reed Bigland. Last night, Cadillac pulled the wraps, official wraps, because they had shown the media it early on the ATS. I think a pretty good looking car and an extremely important car for Cadillac Looks like this is finally going to get them a competitive small car to go out there and see what they can do with their brand. And then as you heard me talking about with uh, Mary Barra, or hopefully heard me talking about, a couple of concept cars from Chevrolet, and that's one thing that I really like seeing at an auto show, is concept cars, signaling where this industry might be going in the future. Because there's been a real dearth, you know, a, a real shortage of concept cars at a number of the, the most recent auto shows. So it's good to see Chevrolet bringing a couple of them out and we'll have to get out and around and see who else has got things on the floor of the show. Earlier, just before we started this, I got to spend some time with uh, Sergio Marchione who was speaking with the broadcast media and uh, just kind of interesting where they see things going, especially with the Jeep brand. He could not stop talking about the next generation Jeep Liberty and he says finally when that thing comes out he's going to be able to rest and feel free so he seems to have a whole lot riding on that he also mentioned uh, that they will be building Jeeps in China even though he had talked earlier about how the Wrangler would only be made in the United States he dropped a big hint that Jeep will be building products in China although it will not be uh, the Wrangler and uh, of course he's looking to uh, the rest of the world to really start growing the brand and uh, so there's a lot going on here at the show a lot of people here as you've heard us talking the the buzz is good instead of everybody moping about uh, how bad things are and how worried they are about the future it's like someone flipped the switch things are looking pretty good at the show especially a lot of international media here. And uh, as a result, this looks like it's going to be a, a gangbusters of a show. We're only halfway through day one and there's a, a lot to be unveiled. We'll be getting a, a lot to you about it. And we've got a couple of more interviews coming up. 
But uh, for right now, I, I think we have ought to take another break and we'll be back with what our next interview is going to be. find the toughness of a Ram 1500 combined with the legendary power of a Hemi V8 in any other truck. It's a beautiful thing. Guts, glory, Ram. The clean diesels are coming. The number of clean diesel light vehicle models offered to North Americans will double by 2014. When given the choice, one in three customers choose clean diesel over gasoline engines. Why? Because of lower total cost of ownership, recouping premium costs in less than 18 months, longer range and better fuel mileage, lower CO2 emissions. Clean diesel, good, economical, functional. Bosch, invented for life. They say that with great power comes great responsibility. Well, when you own a Durango, you'll have tons of power, enough to tow up to 7,400 pounds. So owning a Durango means you now have the responsibility to go dirt biking, ATVing, motorcycling, boating, jet skiing, and show a Ford Explorer a thing or two about what it means to have best-in-class towing. The SUV is back. Welcome back live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show. Hey, we're going to give a little bit of a break here. Not, not a break break. We're going to have our camera go roving around, show you some of the cars that are being out here. We'll come back from that. We've got three more interviews to do. We've got the president of BMW North America, the president of Volvo North America, and the product planning manager for Audi of America. Those will be great conversations. We'll be back in just a little bit. Ludwig? Yes. Hello. John McElroy. Hi, A pleasure. Please come here. So we'll go seven minutes or something like that, and we'll talk all about BMW yeah. and, and the car market. I'd love to do that. Excellent. So as soon as we come out of the break here, they'll let me know.
Welcome back live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show. This is AutoLine, and joining me right now is Ludwig, Ludwig Villisch, the president of BMW North America. Great to have you here with us on AutoLine. My pleasure, thank you very much. Well, your job must be easy. They name you the head of BMW North America, and then all of a sudden you end up number one in the marketplace. You sure ended 2011 in a very strong position. Yeah, and sometimes uh, you just have to be lucky, uh, <laughs> but that's the way it was, yes. Uh -huh. So. For 2012, what do you see? What's new coming from BMW? Well, we just had the world launch of the new 3 Series about half an hour ago, uh, so that's coming. You're at the Detroit show, that's, that's a big introduction here. Yeah, the world premiere of the new 3 Series, and you have to see that every other car since 1976 when we came here uh, has been a 3 Series. So the 3 Series is a very important car to us. And uh, that's coming in February, so we're all excited to welcome that car, and I'm absolutely sure it's going to be a huge success. Now, do you think that you'll just be able to stay where sales were with the 3 Series, or are you expecting to increase sales? As you, having been in the business for quite some time, it's always about growth. No, we're looking at uh, considerable growth next year, uh, not only for 3 Series, but the as far as the whole brand is concerned, so we're very positive because we actually think the whole market will be quite positive. We'll see some growth next year to... This year. This year, <laughs> excuse me, this year. <laughs> but maybe even next year. Maybe, okay, very optimistic. Where do you see that growth coming from? Obviously the new 3 Series, and you just had the X3 that you introduced last year, yes. which gave you an um, enormous amount of momentum. Yes, and uh, uh, if we get more production, and this, this car is a huge success all around the globe. Uh, I think we could even sell a few more. Same holds true with the uh, X5 and X6. Um, we are also introducing a totally new car, which is the six years Grand Coupe. We'll do that in summer. So we have a lot of new product coming through. Uh, we still are, so to say, in the latter part of the launch phase of the um, 5 Series, that's a huge success. We just introduced the 5 Series Hybrid, so I think we'll see a lot of growth all over our model range, so we're very positive. Ludwig, what's the right balance for a brand like BMW in terms of the number of models? You have you just named off a small fraction of everything that you sell. When, when does too much get to be too much? I couldn't really tell you because we have been developing niches over the last 50 years and have, so to say, invented some concepts that weren't there before. So uh, I wouldn't say there is a limit to that, at least I can't see it. So you'll, you would welcome even more models? Oh yes, and we're thinking about that. Well, of course you have your eyes, the electric and the hybrid cars coming too at some point, and what a dramatic design difference they represent. Yes, and they are, as we say, born electric, so those are cars that are actually built from the first place as full electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids, meaning that they're not converted from conventional cars into that. They're made of carbon fiber, which is also unique. We are the first one uh, in a, a production of considerable size uh, to build cars in carbon fiber, thus uh, making up for the additional weight of the batteries. So we're really making a huge step as far as the whole industry is concerned with our BMW i brand and those products that are coming, which uh, we're showing here as uh, concept cars, but I can tell you those concept cars are very, very close already to the real thing. Wow, because they're very dramatic, very yes, dramatic are. styling. Yes. Now, the, the, the open doors, it's almost as if you have glass in the doors, not, not just the window, but yeah. below where the normal window is. Are you going to keep that look going forward? That might change a little because of uh, crash testing and things like that. But I would think people but, just might find it a little bit strange seeing the, the road rush by them so low like that. Usually, uh, when you're sitting in a BMW, you look forward. Okay. Uh, you don't look <laughs> so much to the side or to the rear. That's right. That's good. Um, so you're new to the spot in North America. Are, do you see opportunities or changes that you'd like to make in the organization? And if so, what? Well, uh, I think um, we will very closely work with our dealers. Uh, our dealers have invested more than $3 billion during the last 10 years. And 
I think uh, we need to get closer together with them to really exploit all opportunities, but we'll do this very, very much together. And um, this is what I like to encourage my team and the dealers to say this is a common task that we are after, and uh, I'm pretty sure we'll be successful. Very good. Well, uh, Ludwig Village, thanks so much for coming by and talking to us about BMW. Good having you here. Great fun. Thank you. And we'll be back in just a minute with our next interview. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ludwig. Get off here yeah. safely. Be careful, yeah. And I, I'm dying to come over and look at the 3 Series. As soon as I'm free here, I'll be over there. Please do. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Very good. Thank you. John? Uh, John Maloney, good yeah, to see you again. good seeing you. Please you have a seat. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah right. that's right. Okay. I need the live guy to, you know, kind of be <laughs> Try not to do that all day today. Or right, just throw it over your leg, yeah, too. Probably, That'll get it out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah it looks a lot better that way. So, good for show for you so far? Yeah, good uh, good show, good year for us last year. Good yeah, Merrill, yeah. So good growth in the U.S., which mm -hmm. you know we uh, we needed to have happen. So. Right, right. Well, we're coming out of break. Okay. Welcome back live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show. Great to have you with us. And right now, I've got John Maloney, the president and CEO of. Volvo Cars North America. Great having you here, John. Thanks, John. Glad to be here with you. Great Detroit show. Best weather I've been in a long time in Detroit for <laughs> one of these shows. What, you don't like it when there's not three feet of snow outside? It's, it's, part, of, it's part of the atmosphere. So. That's right. Big changes going on at Volvo these yeah. days. Oh my gosh. So, and, and you're kind of new to the position too. Not kind of, you're brand new to the I, position. I'm brand new officially. I had been the acting president since about May and then became the official president in, in December. Uh, we had a great year in the US. You're right, Volvo's on the move. We uh, ended up the year 25% up year over year. That's a lot. Yeah, that's uh, that was really the the best performance among on a percentage basis among the major luxury. What was it? What do you attribute that to? I, I mean, yeah. of course, the American market was recovering, sure. but you guys recovered more than yeah. it did. Uh, really successful launch of the S60, which is our mid-size sedan that competes with the 3 Series A4. Mm -hmm. uh, really good customer acceptance of that. Uh, XC60, which is our mid-size SUV, uh, has basically been got demand greater than supply for three years. So which I could have done more than because that's not a brand new vehicle. No, that's so, what about it? it you know, getting a little bit deeper into its product design yeah, side. But uh, we had, you know, we had good gains on there, and then even XC90, which has been around even longer, uh, we had gains on that as well. So those three products drove our business. What do you need in the future to keep this growth going? Well, I think in, in 2012, we've got some upside on really actually all three of those products I just described. Uh, S60, it was really not even a full year of it last year. Uh, we will add an all-wheel drive variant of the entry-level car in the middle of the year, which will help us in markets like this, New York, uh, to help us compete better. XC60, frankly, I'm gonna have better availability this year. So we'll see what the upside is on that car with better availability. Going forward, uh, we've already announced that we've got a new generation of engines coming. Volvo has said they're going to go to a, a four-cylinder only strategy. Uh, if you look at the XC60 plug-in hybrid concept that we've got on our show stand today, a uh, couple things that are interesting about it. it. It's a hybrid where you pick, do I wanna go full electric, hybrid, or power, which is basically our four-cylinder, 280-horsepower engine with 70 horsepower from the battery for a total of 350, you know, zero to 65.8 seconds. But the important thing was that four-cylinder that's in that car is the first version of the four-cylinder that comes in a couple years for Volvo. So we're, we're showing some of our future technology. That's interesting. I guess I had missed that, a four-cylinder only strategy. Yeah, Volvo's announced globally that they will go ultimately, you know, as we, it, it'll take some time to go through different modes, but ultimately right. to a four-cylinder only strategy. Very interesting. Yeah. And of course, safety has always been yep. one of Volvo's fortes as part of its brand. What are you looking at in, in terms of maintaining that? Because these days, as you well know, there's a lot of entry-level sure. cars that are impressively safe with all kinds of bells and Absolutely. whistles. So how do you stay ahead yeah, of the game? We, we have, uh, just to be clear, while we're adding design and performance and these other cool technologies, we're never gonna give up the safety leadership. That, that, that's the, you know, the DNA of the brand. 
uh, our, our passive safety is, is renowned, and we'll, we'll continue to make even more gains in active safety as we bring cool technologies like city safety, you know, which will prevent you from you know, running into a car in the rear, or pedestrian detection that senses a pedestrian that if you're not doing anything, you know, it will take some action to intervene. So you, you, there are plenty of, of fronts you can guarantee on the passive side, uh, even in this hybrid, we take special care in protecting the battery. It was something we showed last year. We had a crash C30 electric here last year. We showed how that performed at a 55 mile an hour crash. So it's in our DNA. Uh, it, it, it won't go away. We will be the safety leader. Others will challenge us, uh, but, but that's fine. That actually raises the bar for everybody. How are things inside Volvo? And I, I ask because as you know and our viewers know, uh, Volvo's now owned by the Chinese company sure. Geely, and I'm just wondering how how is that all meshing together? Yeah, so we're uh, you know that all took place August 1st, 2010, when we separated from Ford. Uh, I will tell you that that Volvo is thriving, and yes, the U.S. had a great year. Globally, we're up 20% action on a global basis. Uh, it was the fastest growing luxury brand, and, and what it's really allowed is is Volvo to be Volvo. You know, they've given us the investment, the stability. Uh, we have new leadership in, in our corporate office, Stefan Jacoby, uh, and Volvo is is thriving as being Volvo and being you know an independent company more or less. Uh, so I would say, 16 months into it, things are going quite well. We're doing very very well around the world. Of course, uh, the chairman of Geely would love to see Volvo go more upscale. Yep. How, how do you see that working out in North America? Yeah, uh, we're full supporter of that. I mean, we've we've we as a global level have said by 2020, there's there's a couple things we want to do. You know, we want our global volumes to be about 800,000. We just did under 450,000 this year globally. So, you know, still it's a it's a big step to 800,000. We want a top tier luxury perception, uh, which means you want to play at the top. Doesn't mean in terms of pure volume but certainly in terms of image you know, by 2020. Uh, and that's very clear across the company. Uh, I believe from a U.S. standpoint that's important. Uh, to play in sort of a, a middle ground is, is a very difficult place to play. Others recently in the luxury category have said you know, that's where they're going to play. We're very clear you know, over time, it's not something that'll happen just in 2012, 2013, that, that we're going to go do that. And, and I would even say uh, some of our car lines today are there, S60, XC60, fully competitive, you know, get great cross shopping with all those brands, all those German brands that I won't name here, um, <laughs> you know, but you, but you know who I'm talking about. I, I we sure we do, have great right. consideration. Right. Uh, post-2015, fuel economy standards right. get really tight. I don't see how you can do that without great small cars. I love the C30 from a design right. standpoint, even though it's been out for quite a while, I think it's still the best looking cool. small car out there but it just doesn't sell all that well. What do you need to do in the small car segment? Yeah, we'll, we will always be fo focused certainly in the, in the mid-size segment where the 60s play and up above that. Small cars, um, you know, we have a, an entry there. It's not our main focus in terms of marketing. It's a, it's a fairly niche segment. The car's a great car, by the way, especially with the six speed in that car, it's, it's a fantastic. Uh, you know, our, our product lineup over time does evolve as the cycle plan evolves, but to answer the sort of the fuel economy question, it is one of the reasons we're going to a four-cylinder only strategy where we believe we'll develop, deliver the best-in-class combination of fuel economy and power delivery. So we're saying we're going to deliver six-cylinder performance in our four-cylinder. So that is clearly one of the reasons, along with electrification strategy. Uh, that and turbocharging too, I got to believe, too? Yeah, we haven't said how those four-cylinder engines, I, I can't tell you here how those four-cylinder engines will be uh, powered, uh, but uh, th th there will be Well, some... I just look around the floor and the whole trend of yeah. the industry is downsizing engine. And we already do turbos. And, and turbo and. and turbos is our forte. And it's amazing how well these small displacement turbos really perform. I would have yeah. never expected to see the level of performance Performance. Great performance, you know, good fuel economy, good throttle response. I mean, all the things from many, many years ago, you know, turbo leg is non-existent these days. I mean, you push the gas and the car goes, so. Am I missing anything? What else would you like to talk about of what a Volvo is up to? Um, I don't know that you missed anything else. We're, we're doing quite well. You know, we, we've got, uh, you know, we've got upside in the U.S. And, uh, you know, as long as uh, I get a good supply in the U.S., we're going to do quite well here, so. That's great. John Maloney, thanks so much for stopping thank you. by and bringing us up to speed with Volvo. Okay, thanks, very John. interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks. We're off. Are we off? Good, uh, we're, I don't think we're off yet, but we're going to be okay. back in just a minute with one more interview. And now I think we are. Okay, yeah. sorry, I jumped the gun. Are we off? <laughs> no, no, don't, don't worry about that. Okay, thanks, John. <laughs> thanks I really appreciate it. We'll, we'll yeah, yeah, your, uh, you, you'll have to undo. Well, that's mine, I think. Okay. I think I brought that with me from all my satellite things. <laughs> I can't just bring like one satellite thing after the next one. I've got more to do with that, too. I can't leave that behind. I'll well, I'll here. stop by and see your hybrid then, too, yeah, your plug-in. Yeah. Stop by when you get a chance. I'll do that. Thanks. John, thanks so much.
Gino, good, good seeing you, man. Yeah. Happy New Year. This good. was good. Gino, good. Just trying to get in the back shot. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Just, just sneaking in the back shot. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Was he okay? Yeah, no, no, no. He's good. Excellent. He's definitely good. Good. He's uh, very conversational, you know, knows what he's talking about. Good. Good to see you. John McElroy. Hi, Mark, John. how do you do? Yeah, Welcome. good seeing you. Philip Robeck, he's our Philip. general manager. Philip Robeck. Please have a seat. Excellent. It's a real pleasure to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> it's great to have you here with us. Thank you. And now you're you're my last interview of the day, so my, my it's work. It's either really good or really bad. Yeah, I don't know. It'll be good. It'll be good. <laughs> you see your the wire too, behind Phillip. there. <coughs> you know, Philip, just move the, lo the, the wire over over this way and, and it'll it always tend way. to yeah nah, it's out of the way. Yeah. excellent watched many so, years of your show oh, enjoyed excellent. that quite a bit that's great spent quite a few years over here in Detroit before we moved over to uh, to Herndon so uh -huh. been with Audi about 14 years Welcome back live from the floor of the Detroit Auto Show. We've got one more interview to do. I'm thinking you're going to enjoy it as much as I think I'm going to. Joining us right now is Philip Brabeck, the head of product planning for Audi North America. Philip, yes. thanks for stopping by. John, great to be here. So product planning, oh my gosh, you must have one of the, the greatest smorgasbords of products to choose from as to what you want to do because Audi has got so much coming out these days. Yeah, we do. Uh, well, I would like to say that we're fairly fortunate in that regard. And, uh, you know, we've really tried to do our best to bring the best of it to North America. And um, so things are going well so far. So last year you had what, all new A6, A7. Yeah, big product year for us. You know, we, we were just coming off launching the A8 in, in, in late 2000. Uh, late 2010 and then uh, in uh, in 11 we brought the a7 and the a6 uh, so basically all the higher segment vehicles were completely new for us and um, you know the a7 has been so exciting and uh, has brought a lot of attention to the brand uh, also great press response on the car and the a6 has really seen a great success so overall we're very very pleased so what do you do for 2012 well, it's probably going to be just as busy, if not busier. Um, there are two kind of big things happening. One is um, we have a product freshening of the all the A4 line, and that's going to mean some major changes, uh, because besides having the A4 and the S4 that we've had until now, we're actually going to upgrade the Avant model to the new all-road, and we're also going to bring a brand new RS5, which is very exciting addition, a top model for the A5 model line. So very, very exciting there. And uh, we're also adding performance models to the A6, A7, A8. So we're going to have S6, S7, and S8 um, coming all in the summer of this year. So it's going to be a very big product year for us. Does it ever get too confusing? You have so many models, so many derivatives, and, and performance brands. You know, I think one of the things we've done in the recent years is we try to also position the, the models very clearly. So, you know, we always have a base model, and then our performance model is the S model. And then, you know, just a few handful of very exclusive RS models that we typically add to few car lines here and there to really just uh, sort of show the uh, performance dynamic of the brand. Mm -hmm. There's rumors out there now that Audi's looking at bringing back the A2. What can you tell us? <laughs> well, you know, obviously we had a car that we showed uh, in Frankfurt, which was, which was the uh, all-electric study. And uh, so it's a car that we're looking at. I, you know, would certainly make, make, uh, make a point of that. Um, a car that is basically a smaller size than today's A3 is something that's intriguing to us. But, you know, we don't have any definite announcements today. Our announcement today was actually more relative to the SUV segment. Mm -hmm. Which is, you announced the, uh, the, the, Q3. the Q3. Yes, that's right. So, uh, to so our a, a baby SUV, as it were, a crossover. That's exactly right. So, our, to our family of uh, Q models like the Q5 and the Q7, we are now also going to be adding Q3 and it'll go into production end of next year. 
And of course, that segment is the hottest segment in the business right now, Oh yeah, now, the, isn't the, it? yeah the, the Q5 has been absolutely smashing success for us, and uh, really, um, um, uh, it's been absolutely great. But I mean, getting a Q3, just a little size smaller, I yeah. would think, really puts you in the sweet spot of that crossover. Oh, absolutely. Crossover I mean, I, I, think, I think we're definitely going to be able to address the, uh, the, the, the crossover customers, and we think maybe even some of our uh, current A3 Sportback customers might look at that as an alternative as well. I always love talking to you folks at Audi about diesels. Yes. What are your plans in that regard, and how are sales of that engine going? Well, sales are better than expected, John. I mean, we have seen absolutely great success. You know, we've sold steady over half of our A3 volume in TDI. Uh, so that, I think, speaks for itself. Over half in the United over States? Over half in the United States is coming with diesel engine. Uh, and nearly half in the Q7 car line. So again, that's telling you that there's a very strong um, uh, a demand for, for, for a clean diesel product. And uh, we're going to add even more. Um, we have uh, just announced also today uh, that we are bringing the A8 as well as the A6 uh, and eventually also the Q5 with the diesel powertrain. So those things will be here within 18 months as well. So you think that there is really good upside potential, obviously, in the American market with diesels? Absolutely do, absolutely do. And I tell you, our customers absolutely love them. They, they are great on fuel economy. They are great on driving dynamics. They're very powerful. They have great torque characteristic, and they're very quiet. So there's really no drawback to, to diesel technology, you know? Philip, what, what, what's the deal with hybrids then? Because hybrids, especially the luxury ones, they can't give them away and yet you're telling me that the diesels are selling really well. What in the customer's mind makes them think, I want to go with a diesel and not a hybrid? Well, I think, you know, we always say that there is a, you know, each, each product has its own kind of application and the, uh, the, the customers that focus more on longer uh, distance driving, they prefer the diesel because of course, over the long distances, the diesel makes a lot more sense. The customers that are in the city, they are more looking for a hybrid alternative because they're looking for that stop and go dynamic and they're looking for that kind of stuff. So we firmly believe that there's place for both. And uh, you know, so far we've been pushing a lot of diesels and it's worked very well for us. Well, as I started out saying, you've got the biggest smorgasbord of products and powertrains and everything out there. It's, it's really impressive to see what Audi has. Any holes in the lineup? Is there anything where you go, aha, here's another one that we have to bring hmm. out? You know, I think as you know, we in the, in, the, in the product world, we always look at uh, what, are, what are the portfolio um, gaps and where we can possibly fill. I'm very happy where we are in the stage of development of the brand in North America, uh, particularly in the development of the higher end models, the A6, the A7, the A8. Um, as we get more stability and even more growth in those segments, I think there might be some uh, chance to look at maybe some smaller segment cars, and those are some things that we are currently looking at and evaluating. Very good. Well, Philip Varek, thanks so much for stopping by and talking about Audi with us. John, absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Very good. And uh, this is going to bring us to the end of this live webcast. It's been terrific spending the last hour and a half talking with you all. We'll be back here again tomorrow. We're going to do it a little bit differently. Instead of sitting here at a table and having people sit down and do interviews, we're going to walk all around the show and do interviews as we're walking around. So join us again here tomorrow at 12 noon. We'll start off right here at the, the Chrysler Display, our signature sponsor for this webcast. But thank you all for having tuned in. Want to thank all our media sponsors who were carrying the show as well. And you folks in the, the chat room that were help monitoring that. I'm signing off now, but thanks much for having tuned in. Very good, Philip. Excellent. Very interesting. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank Very you, much Phil. a pleasure. Auto Line Live from the North American International Auto Show is brought to you by our signature sponsors Chrysler, Dodge, Fiat, Jeep, and Ram, and also by Audi. Truth in Engineering. Bosch, the number of clean diesel models in North America will double by 2014. Bosch Clean Diesel, good, clean, fun. And by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion.